Thanks. Thank you, Bertie. Welcome. The stage is all yours. Thank you. Hi, guys. How are you guys doing? All right. I guess it's the last one uh, of, uh, of this whole show. They say the best for the last. Um, cool. So, um, how to picture VC? Well, there is this common sort of idea that VCs are something like this, right? They're pretty scary. They like fight your head off and they ask you all these questions and they go over your ideas and it's really hard speaking to one. Well, actually, I think VCs are a bit more like this of experience, right? They may look scary from outside, from far away, but actually, it's all just a shell. When you really get down to matter of it, they're all the same. I've been one for five years, so I should know. So a quick intro on myself. Um, I started as an engineer, worked as an engineer for a couple of years in network engineering. I was a pretty engineer. So I could be saying, okay, let's not do that, and let's go start some companies. So I started a few internet businesses. The first one in web development and web solutions. This was a long time ago, about uh, 15 years ago. It grew to about 200 corporate customers, and we got acquired after that point. Um, I then launched another business called Muscle Pool, which did um, it was basically a headhunting platform. A lot of the kind of activity that happens on LinkedIn today happened on our platform. People would profile themselves anonymously on the platform and recruitment agencies and uh, employers would directly target them on the platform and get in touch with them. They would message to and fro, and when the conversation reaches maturity, they would reveal their identity and that's when we go higher. After about two years of running that business, we got approached by a national recruitment services business. Um, pretty decent offer from four year olds running the company, and um, so we decided to sell the business to them. Um, and then I moved on to running an English language training software business, a VC pack company. They brought me in as startup CEO, and I ran that for them for a year and a half or so. Um, and then I attempted another ad network business uh, here in the UK, actually. It's only not think that I thought that I was all in New Zealand when I grew up. And then I did this ad network business, which we built very cool technology to place contextually relevant ads within images online. Um, great idea, with some great technology, but ultimately we didn't find quite a market fit for that one. Um, we had raised a lot of money for it, about 250k, and as I was winding that business down, I happened to meet a couple of very, very cool VCs, and then again we have heard of a business called Coupon Capital, um, a, a fund based in Soho, to invest in companies that have network effects. Okay? So it's anything that as it grows bigger, and as it gets more users, and it gets bigger, it just becomes more useful for everybody. For to child businesses, would be something like an Airbnb, or an Uber, eBay, um, the previous generation. So we invested in businesses of that nature. Two of them that we invested in uh, at a sub-10 milk valuation went on to be unicorn businesses. You might have heard of FanDuel, which is a fantasy sports business, and also Autobahn, which is a copy of b bargain car in Germany. Um, both reached the reach billion dollar valuation. I then moved about two and a half years ago to Forward Partners. <coughs> Forward we invested a lot more early stage, so 250 to 500k checks in idea stage to seed stage companies. Um, focused on e-commerce, marketplaces, and related software companies. Uh, so here we invested in things like Lost My Name. Anyone heard of Lost My Name? Um, no? okay. uh, it's, a, it's a personalized children's book. I'll tell you a bit more about it later on today. Um, Halo, Zopa, uh, a bunch of other companies of that nature. Companies that were building strong consumer brands. About three months ago, I left Forward Partners to start a new business called Dwell. Um, Dwell does uh, mortgages much more convenient, simple, fast, in app and online. It's a really paper based, face to face, arduous um, process at the moment. And I'm trying to digitize all of that and make that easy. Okay, so that's me. So it was about um, a year and a half, March last year, that I gave this exact same talk um, at another Dean State event. And this was a slide. We were all talking about bubbles back then. We were saying, are we in a bubble? Is this thing going to burst? And you know, the kind of jokes that were going around was a million guys walk into a pub in Silicon Valley. Nobody buys anything, but the pub is declared a great success. <coughs> this was happening you know, only about 15 months ago. Um, and I made the point at that time that you know, it was a buzzy market, but it wasn't exactly um, overly inflated, or it wasn't really a bubble, in my opinion. And we looked at these sorts of graphs that show deal activity was very strong. Um, and we said, well, basically, the underlying fundamentals are quite strong because, you know, in general, 
Um, local markets are much bigger right now compared to the dot-com era. Um, you have very attractive emerging markets with uh, you know, billions of people with smartphones um, that you can sell stuff to. Lots of underlying fundamentals, um, which for which reason we thought that the market was you know, very strong. Um, and so I was making the point that the markets are healthy, not exactly inflated, um, but then towards the end of last year, this happened. So out of nowhere, all of the wind was taken out of the sales, and um, there was a massive correction in the market. Right? Everybody aware of all the slowdown and the sales? Um, so what happened? So this is what happened, right? So if you look at what happened towards the end there, uh, 2015, 2016, big dip in amount of money being invested, as well as the number of deals getting done. As you can see, number of unicorns being started. Right? Companies reaching unicorn status, also did. It all started with Fidelity um, investing in private companies, starting to downgrade their portfolio. Right? The first they downgraded uh, Dropbox, then they did Square, then they downgraded Snapchat, and now I think they've downgraded more than like 20 of these private um, late stage businesses in their portfolio. The last one over there is Power Technologies. Who's at a Power Technology? <laughs> this is the company that reached um, 2.7 billion valuation, uh, took up the last two um, last two floors of Heron Towers right here, raised $200 million, blew through all of that in no time in the past. <laughs> so, so these sorts of you know, unicorns started just dying and disappearing. Um, so lots of fundamental reasons why that happened. Uh, late stage hedge funds who had no real understanding of startups and venture markets starting to invest in startups, they invest in like Uber and uh, a whole bunch of uh, other companies, pumped up the late stage valuations without really understanding where they're going to get the exit from. Um, there's a huge glut in the market because companies were stay, choosing to stay private longer and not exiting. And that meant that you know, there aren't any massive companies to purchase them either. So there is a lack of exits. And when you have a lack of exits, all of that capital is tied up. You know, the money cycle is not going one of the reasons, but for lots of other reasons, the party kind of came crashing down. It didn't quite crash, and we kind of go playing a little bit here, it didn't really crash. Um, but there was a good, strong, healthy correction. Uh, mostly in the States, over here, it didn't really happen all of that that much, because first of all, European investors tend to be a lot more pragmatic, so we never really inflated the value of uh, um, the investments that we were doing over here all that much. We didn't really get very fuzzy, stuff with the fundamentals. Um, entrepreneurs will always complain about that, right? You know, the an investor, they're too conservative, they don't get it, look at these companies in the States. Um, but you know, if you look at the true cycle, this, it's better for everybody that we remain pragmatic and, and make sense of investments. Okay, so that's kind of just setting the scene, let's get into um, fundraising itself. So, one point I want to make on when you start on this fundraising journey is get in the VC shoes, right? So, see the world from their perspective. Um, and that will give you a lot more empathy and opportunity to be able to, you know, um, understand the world from their eyes and actually play the right parts and get into that journey. Um, so just a bit of background on how, how venture funds work. There's something called a 220 venture model. What this means is when a fund is raised, let's say it's from you, 2% um, of that headline figure will be used as um, yearly management fees from the LPs, the limited partners who are investing in the Fund. That's how we pay all the investment people's salaries, the marketing budget, everything else is paid from that 2%. The 20% reflects on, it refers to the profit share when companies exit and we get back the, um, the, the proceeds from those sales, the fund gets to keep 20% and the remaining 80% goes back to um, the limited partners who invested in the company in the first place. We look for two big hits in every 10 that we invest in. Rough rule of thumb. Um, five usually return your money and we don't make it at all. In general, if you look at uh, historic performance of good VC funds, this would be this would pretty much like that. Um, so we are looking for big hits, but not necessarily unicorns. You know, not every business has to be a billion dollar business to make sense for a VC investment. One of, the, one of the most influential factors is how much money the VC has actually raised. If you were a massive billion dollar fund, then of course you have to 
the investment companies that uh, make it to five billion or ten billion pound valuation um, for the multiples to make sense. But um, forward was a twenty-five ish million pound fund, and uh, two pound where I worked before that was a twenty million euro fund. And so for, for these funds, if you were able to exit at anywhere between two hundred million and four hundred million, that the math would work. So why I'm saying this is you have to make the case that your company can be worth that much when you go to these funds. Um, returning the fund is something that VCs are really interested in. When they say return the fund, they mean that does any single individual investment you make, does it have the potential to return the total amount that we pick? So that would be 25 or four. Um, so let's say that you know we invest in the business, we take 10% of it, and assuming we face no further dilution, we would expect that that business exits at 250 mil, so that we have 10% of it, we get that 25 mil, we put it um, And overall, as a fund, we look for a 3x return on capital. It's uh, a benchmark. If you're doing, if you are able to generate 3x returns for your investors, you're doing very well. We have to do deals. Sorry, I'm um, just going to have to accept the three times it's out of one year. No, so that's generally your opinion. Yeah, and most VC funds are in your funds. Um, if you were in private equity or any type of investment, the time value of money would you know, it, it count a lot and you would actually be reporting the down one higher or higher amount rather than multiple, multiple, uh, multiple on capital investment. But in VC, we just look at that. Because every time this, the exit's coming from the report IRR, you have to do it. Um, okay, so we have to do deals, right? So you just give it. We've said to all of our LPs, you're going to do X number of investments, you're going to deploy your capital, and we're going to make some profit. So we have the pressure to make regular investments. We're not just sitting there waiting for the next latest slam dunk from one of the investments. Um, but it, they have to be investments that fit. The other thing that most VCs tell their LPs, their investors, is that we don't make investments in such and such category. Most of that, most funds do. You know, either at forward it was we only make e-commerce um, or marketplaces or related software. Right? So if you happen to be something outside of that, and that and that and that and amazing. Um, a career is dependent on the investments you make. The statement, but obviously we're looking for those winners. But there's so little time. There are very, very small teams processing lots of deal flow. Right? At Forward, there's two of us um, in the, uh, in the well, three of us in the investment team, two of us actually processing all of that deep, um, deal flow that comes in. In last year, 2015, we processed 2,000 law leads, 2,000 companies were introduced to us. So a lot of companies to look at. And that means that we are stimulating the efficiency. So what happens is A, we get back to B, yeah, we have you know, to just see too many decks or any individual entrepreneur sending us their deck, you know, they put a lot of effort into it, they you know, keep a lot, and um, it's a beautiful thing story for them, but for us it's another deck at the end of the day. Um, so what I'm trying to get across over here is we start to see happen very quickly. We don't look at all of the details in the deck. So if you understand that, you can create a deck that very quickly just gives the sound bites to the investor who literally spending 30 seconds in the first show. If it then appeals, then of course it's a very little bit of a lot. Okay, so a few uh, pointers. Um, when, when you're getting out and trying to get uh, in front of investors, try and get introduced. Uh, I know everybody has said this to you, and it's kind of obvious as well, but um, it's really hard when you may not have networks. Um, but these days there are plenty of uh, options like LinkedIn and other ways to you know, warm contact people, have an angle pin, not just, hey, I have a good idea, you want to invest. Have a warm, warm lead if you can, stand out, and understand fit. I'll get into these a bit more. Okay, so getting introduced, like I said, there's no excuse for email bombing, don't do it. Um, I think out of those 2,000, there was maybe five or 10 companies that I met. Um, as a result of the uh, email bombing, for the email, but other than that, everything I ignore. Um, events. There's lots of great events. Um, campus, right here. They run lots of events here. Table Crowd. Um, 
which is a concept for dining with a bunch of uh, people on a, um, on a concept that you're interested in, um, led by a person who is you know, um, well known in that space. Um, demo days, these are really good to go to. You get a real flavor for what sort of company are getting into the accelerator programs, and uh, you also see um, you know, how they're pitching and how they're crafting their decks and all of that. So it's really good, useful experience. Um, very helpful organizations, right? Dreamstay of Paul and Marina doing a great job here introducing entrepreneurs um, to investors. They've got a good network. That's a very good warm lead. They will um, assess your you first and your product and your business, and they know which investors are looking for what. So, and then when it's sent from an organization like Dreamstay to an investor, you take that a lot more seriously. It's you know, a very high chance of meeting. Angel list notifications. So this actually worked as a good tool for me, a really good tool actually. So if you're not on angel list and you're trying to get traction, uh, attract attention of investors, get on angel list. But I had all my alerts set up, and I had monthly startups, e-commerce businesses, um, looking for certain amount of funding, and I used to get a lot of regular keys of alerts. And those are very much exactly what I'm looking for for angel list attention. Every investor does this. So put yourself on angel list. Office hours, a lot of uh, um, funds run office hours. At Forward Partners, we used to run office hours, a lot of dates will do. Um, every every uh, month, it's a short meeting, 15 minutes, um, face to face, but you get to you know, get in there, get in front of the investor, and uh, see what their first reactions are. Fit. So, what do I mean by fit? So, I referred earlier to every fund investing in specific areas. So, it could be either teams, it could be stages, it could be sectors. But every fund will have some sort of a, um, a thesis that they're investing in. And it is very unlikely that they will invest in your company if it does not fit. So it is really important to understand that fit and craft to a pitch the words to, you know, to you know, not, not fake it, but you, know, you save yourself a lot of time as well if you just went to the right investors you want to invest in that you're working on. So as an example, I'm using um, forward again here, so forward partners, we said transactional e-commerce businesses is what we're interested in. That's, that was a core, um, but in terms of features of businesses that we liked, there were a few things, and there were things like mass customization, we love the idea of mass customization, um, and typical, a great example is made.com, right? so you can get uh, small batches of uh, beautiful furniture, uh, but it's customized to what people want. And it's limited, limited editions. Personalization. This is a really good one. So this is Lost My Name. Lost My Name, the company I mentioned before, is a personalized children's book. The idea is that a child has lost his or her name and goes through a journey on the, in this book to recover his or her name. Um, and when a child goes through this book, um, they get this whole emotional sort of wow moment that resonates and the parent just sees that. And they invariably go on purchase another book for their, you know, their friends' children or their nieces and nephews and so on. So it generates a massive value. That's what personalization can do. It really resonates, people really talk about it. It's a great car. And that's what we look for. And Lost My Name, by the way, it did extraordinarily well, one of the best performance of um, the forward portfolio for 2014. Um, 20x their revenue in. We like companies that involve their customers. So it's all about you know, not keeping yourself in a cave and building a product based on some imaginary problem that you see, but involving your customers throughout the journey. Um, we like companies that oil the wheels of e-commerce. So here we're talking about payment businesses, logistics businesses, software to manage inventory. Um, e-commerce is big. There's all of these statistics that show that it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so that's why we wanted to invest in companies that are you know, you know the old idea that um, sell the spades to the gold diggers? Those are the guys that made the most money. It's that kind of theory. Great marketplace opportunities, vertically integrated business models. So this is a, a, a thesis where companies are taking control of the end-to-end -end value chain. So all the way from the customer-facing sales content through to the design and manufacturing of the product to the sourcing materials. If you can do that, then you're actually controlling the Overall quality and experience of the end customer is getting. Poster type, this type of business model is a business in the States called Walking Up, that you can do 
out there, they do very well at this kind of model. In other cases, it's called bonobos, which does menswear, or to the same type of model. And we invested in a business called Spoke in London that does that for many students. Um, capital efficient and inventory light models. I guess the best example here was um, a business called Thread.com. Anyone use Thread? Yeah, cool. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a style and outfit recommendation app for men. So it understands what your style preferences are, helps you discover new styles, and um, helps you basically stay uh, looking sharp, looking stylish, whatever it is, um, based on um, an algorithm that really understands your preferences. We've got no inventory, right? It's just recommending other people's product, it sends the orders off to these people who have. You know, stock in big warehouses, they handle all of that fixed cost. And um, Thread just gets to make a very uh, inventory-like uh, business model and commission on that. Strong brand potential is always very important. So, uh, fundraising is a beauty pattern. It's just the way it is. So, you should just embrace it. Right? So, all the, um, the investors they talk about the best company that are fundraising right now, World Express, is World Bank. And they talk about the best companies they've seen. And they're voting for the best companies. So, make sure you've got your thoughts ready. What do you need? You need a three to four paragraph email summary that's really catchy. I'll go into what is a great summary and what not. A uh, short and sweet investor debt, you know, financial model, and KPI dashboard. And KPI dashboard, that's the, uh, if, if you've got that, and it's, uh, the data is seen in the story. Okay, so how to write a great email summary. Unicorn has numerous attractions for investors. It is focused on rapidly developing multi billion dollar premium simulated gambling market in the primary, attractive high margin B2B business model for this market, blah 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 blah. This is the message for that. Now, why is this a really bad email summary? Well, because it actually just says nothing about what the company actually does. They're just full of these buzz buzzwords and you know, phrases, um, pioneering, rapidly developing, cluster of explosive growth, creating shareholder value, all these baseless promises. You need to use credibility in our business. So, what is a good email summary? Here's one. Um, Headline statement, Mr. Basics sells the value range of men's grooming products to price sensitive customers on a monthly subscription. I know exactly what they're selling, who they're selling it to, and what their business model is. So now I'm interested. Okay, so the next three very clearly segmented um, bits of uh, information. I've got consistent traction, great. And I've got the right team, fantastic. And now they're telling me there's a significant addressable market. Product. You've got a product that's already selling and gaining traction in the market. You've got a great team. Good. So now, you know, if you succeed, you know, there's a big, big price to be won. But this is great, right? Like simple bullet points, which immediately get my attention. It tells me that they know exactly what they're doing and they feel about this. This is a great thing that's on It makes me feel like yeah. It's weird, huh? It's just an email somewhere. It makes them that happy. Well, you know the first one that I showed you? 99 out of 100 email summaries, they look like that. So if I see one like well, the later one I showed you, I'm happy. So the best pitch deck in the world is not going to save a poor business, obviously. So what, what uh, assuming you have a good business, what's a, what's a great business? So let's start the deck with why is this exciting? What's the headlines looking for? What is so exciting about what we're doing? Fred. To create the future of how men buy clothes. That's exciting. If they actually achieve that, they don't think about that. That's like half the world's population. They're going to teach them how to buy clothes. Replacing thousands of inefficient car companies with a single user friendly consumer app. While they also raise the most money in the world and kill all other competition. Yes. That's a the empowering scores of authors and makers. The platform and tools to build our own business. That's, like, you know, that's exciting vision statements. Then get into what is the problem. Get it clear about what the problem is. This is a this is a good one. I like this one. 
But uh, by the way, all of these are real examples. These are all stuff taken from um, companies that have over time sent me pictures. We won't see their names in here. I've said the names, but these are all real. So her headline statement here is: um, People in China love to buy Western luxury goods, but obtaining them is a real thing. Okay, so, but a little bit more detail. Local sites in China are selling place. You know, foreign sites are in English, so Chinese people can't understand them. Most don't ship to China, blah, blah, blah. So it's a yeah, clear, clear problem statement. And then get tell me, okay, so if that is the problem that we're trying to solve, how big is this problem? Okay, so that's when you get into the market, market sizing. Two ways of doing market sizing, um, bottom up and top down. Do both, and, and make sure that they sort of um, match up. So, Top down is when you look at the overall market size um, of an industry. In this case, uh, London Home Delivery Food Market is a billion pounds. And work your way down to if you, for certain reasons, took X percent of those um, chunks, what will you end up with? You can read through this, I'm going to read it out, but eventually you get your 100 million pounds revenue in your business if you follow the logic there. And then do the bottom up bit, which is to say if we had X amount of resources, whether that was marketing dollars or um, manufacturing people or whatever it may be, that ground level of resource that you have to create your product and distribute it. If you had that, then what will you end up with as a size of business? So in this example, average takeaway delivers 100 meals a night using five drivers, each delivering five orders an hour and working four hours a night. So that's the kind of map. Work the logic out, and in this case, it turns out to be 75 million. More or less behind the million dollars of the um, top down no, that's, that's, that's useful. Okay, so once you've said what's the problem, how big is that problem, so what is your solution? What is, what is your unique solution? So what is your slice there? Um, you, you have to have obviously an amazing product, and you have to show how it uh, really solves the problem. So if it's already out of the market, and people are buying it, and they're loving it, great. Otherwise, a demo, whatever you you can do to make it real for investors. Um, the Kaizen bit that I'm talking about here is the, the lead startup idea where it is continuous improvement, it's continuous experimentation. You keep on getting better in, uh, well, in every aspect of your business, but this is particularly the product. Okay, I had a few examples there, but why you, right? And I think it would be amazing if a team said, we've got the brains of this guy and the balls of that guy, you know? <laughs> That'd be a great team, right? Imagine these two together. Um, so it's, it's essentially looking for the features that we think lead to success and making sure that they exist inside a, a team. Um, for me, a few things are domain expertise, really important, especially if you're, if you're starting in um, complex markets, um, domain expertise is very important. We don't necessarily mean, um, it's actually more domain knowledge, right? It doesn't have to be experience, as in you haven't spent 15 years in insurance, it's fine. Um, as long as you have maybe done a lot of research to really understand that space better than anyone else, it's great. Great charisma and leadership, attracting talent is very difficult for startups. You have to have a, um, a senior management team, founders who have charisma to take people on that journey. I mean, they've got nothing, you know, they've got an idea, they've got a basic product, hardly any traction. Why would anyone come to work for you? Why would anybody invest in you? Why would anybody partner with you? You have leadership and charisma. Honey badges. So never, you know, this is this is where just just don't be afraid of like, just capturing and um, getting what you want. Really useful skill to have. Having a great financial model, super important, right? Um, you have to make reasonable assumptions, uh, make it out to three years. Three years is actually a bit much, maybe two years. Have really good notes in the financials that any, any layman can understand your thinking as to how you got them. It's important that you show them how you got them, your variables, your benefits, and you can get the conversion rates, the average values. Whatever it is that you remember is um, show how it came about. Make it easy to do sensitivity analysis. When you send it to a VC, we're going to play with those numbers. We're going to like cut the conversion rate by half or you know, increase the average order value by two, put two times as much stock in your model, and see what happens. Um, and make it easy for us to do that because then you 
get a better understanding of the business. Um, and a KPI dashboard, like I said, that's all the metrics. That's really useful to have it. At the meeting, right? That's oops, he's a venture capitalist, is what I thought I was going to meet, but it's a vulture capitalist. Be aware of the terms. I'm not going to talk too much about terms today, we don't have the time, but that's another whole thing. So at the meeting, keep it conversational. You know, you know, just don't be too formal and stuff. You know, build a rapport and build a relationship with that meeting itself, that's right. Throw insights, you know. The VC uh, almost always does not have as much knowledge about your market as you do. You're the expert. So, you know, we're looking at you for all your insights. Give us those insights about non obvious that only a deep expert or a person with deep knowledge in the industry will know. Maintain the right confidence balance. I've sat in, I've sat in um, pictures where you know, the is just way too cocky, you're overconfident, and doesn't really sit very well. And also in um, other pictures where there's a complete lack of it. And so there's no response to the questions that you're asking, and it doesn't flow, flow so well. Don't be defensive, right? This is one that a lot of entrepreneurs get wrong. I understand it. I've been an entrepreneur many, many times. If somebody else says, oh, I won't work for all of these reasons, uh, it feels really shit, and you tend to get defensive, and you're like, well, you're not understand this, um, you're just not seeing it. <laughs> uh, it's a common mistake, but the problem is that investors, it's their job to poke holes. And once they poke all of these holes and it still stands up, then they can invest in it. And ask great questions. So make the VCs pitch as well. There's lots that you need to learn about them. Make sure that, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs will say, um, you know, when the VC says, well, what is it that you want from us? I say, oh, we want you know, the best partners, or we want the most knowledgeable investors. We say, well, what does that mean? And we find out that it's, 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 it's the same. Um, so I would say it, it is important. This is like, it's more, it's more prominent than an average. If, if, if an average um, tech startup takes eight to nine years to exit, that's the, there is no breakup. Together for that whole journey. So make sure you take the right investors on board. Last point: cover your activities. So in every industry, every um, business model that I've seen, the venture industry just very quickly um, converges to a few points on on why a certain business model will not work. So here's a few examples. And so make sure you have answers to those those questions, right? So if people say, "Yeah, we're a game winning business. We have a fantastic." The question is going to be, well, okay, so how do you make it? And we can't invest in a single game hit or a single um, book package. Hit. So, you know, we need to invest in a distributor that has the DNA, the ability to continuously do this. So, how do we do it? These are examples, by the way. So, you know, right, what I'm giving you here are common questions for these sorts of industries. We're a concierge app, the economic stuff. Right? How are you going to address that? We are a new ad technology business. Most of them just have incremental innovations. Um, it's very easy to become a successful SME. How do you become a blow out success? We are a payment service. Well, there's only 2.5% of margin in the entire value chain. The issuer takes half of it. The merchant back takes the other half. But how do you make any money? We're a marketing app. Have you seen the market map when you were in that street? It's like, it grows exponentially. So, we're ready to sit that. Okay, good luck. <laughs> it's also true, so um, I think it's a really good advice there. And um, well, he's done a great job of uh, finishing Christopher on time. And before I forget to say this, what I need to do, can you stack your chairs at the back before you leave? And um, it'll say the new thing at all. And uh, it uh, puts a lot more uh, effort into the thing. So, um, I think we've just got a couple of minutes, so it might be better. Um, so, uh, maybe, um, maybe maybe two questions. Um, so, the other hand to note is, is the picture similar to an A1 picture? So, or, or is it kind of way bigger aspirations or shorter projections? Or does the angel have a similar viewpoint? You mean if you're trying to raise money from an angel yeah, right. versus from a VC? Yeah. Um, angels tend to make decisions a bit more from their heart. Yeah. Um, 
So I would put things that are more appealing to them personally. If you were approaching an angel, some of them like to get really involved with the company they invest in. Um, so that is, that is a slightly different angle to show them how it might be fun to work with you and your company. Um, Well, okay, you, you could say a little bit about it. You could say, well, you know, we're probably more likely to have a trade sale in, in seven years' time, or rather, we're, you know, we're probably going to have a deal. But I've seen the pitch deck where they don't really have to be careful and say, in five years' time, we're going to have so much revenue, multiples of our industry, it's definitely going to be a trade sale. It's really good. It's really good. Really good. Uh, two albums in the future, which is going to be a trade sale. So, a few more comments, right? We have five people to the industry. Why? Why? What did you do? We probably followed maybe 50% of the rules uh, that I put out here about what the email summary needs to look like, what the tech needs to look like. Um, I would say more than any of those things, the biggest reason I would have gotten back to them and not to them is what they were doing. What they were doing, and that's an e commerce business that was doing um, personalized um, tools. And I was like, oh, that's exactly. Because we have a, we, we talk a lot about what sort of businesses we want to be investing in, what's happening, what's the difference, what's the big risk for that. And when you see something that fits that, it's not the same. Okay, um, last question. Uh, should it be, but when asking for how much money, to what extent should we be explaining what we have to use that for? Maybe we could do this much for this amount, or to this amount, or this amount. At sure. what stage of that conversation? Yeah, really good question. I think I left it out of uh, what I put over here, but yes, you need to have a um, towards the end of the deck, there needs to be a slide that says user points, and quite a time that will break down of saying X percent on marketing, X percent on hiring and team building, X percent on product or whatever. Um, but you will, they will, you know, there will be a deeper conversation on that, obviously. Um, so we have the, uh, the financial model that backs up what you said in that summary slide. What does it have multiple options? What about something which there are two or three viable options? You should probably just state your most ideal um, scenario with, without too many options. Because if you lead the conversation in with saying I have all of these different options and scenarios, it feels like you just don't know exactly what you're doing. Um, and so highly dependent on how much money you raise. It's a practical fact of what you will do it does depend on how much money you raise. But um, I would sort of I would uh, I leave that to the next conversation from the <laughs> first meeting. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Okay, guys, I think um, my last one. Today, what kind of thing is it that you have to do with the company? Um, and it, it depends very much on um, actually, it depends mostly on the average order value. You know, if you're selling seats on the private jets and you're making a pound, then that would make sense. But if you're selling e-commerce, beauty products, and 10 pounds at a dollar value, then that would make sense. Thank you. Thank you, Prajeev. So that's great. A very nice presentation, right? right? Yes. So I don't know if you, if you would be available on email. Yeah. So I definitely can uh, just maybe yeah. talk to, to you after the presentation. And thanks to you guys who stayed for the whole the whole day, the whole thing this afternoon. Yeah. Thanks, great job guys. So can can we put a long to that? So next event is gonna be on thirty first of June. Again about education of that. And we're gonna have amazing panel. We're gonna have really, really successful startups and networks and famous entrepreneurs and investors and they're gonna discuss uh, everything about funding for EdTech. So it's usually not uh, only for EdTech, so you can just come and see how how we can ask questions about in general about investing.